uninstalled TikTok and WeChat. Donald Trump bans the two popular Chinese apps, citing security concerns. Does this rob Americans of their freedoms? And will it lead to an east-west divide of the internet? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiadine. Starting this Sunday, Americans will not be able to download two of the most popular social media apps in the world. The US Department of Commerce said it would bar people from getting Chinese apps TikTok and WeChat through any app stores on any platform. President Donald Trump insists the app's parent companies threaten national security and could pass user data to China. Well, we'll have a panel of experts to discuss this in just a moment. But first, this report from our White House correspondent, Kimberly Halkett. A stern rebuke from the U.S. president. We're not going to do anything to jeopardize security. The White House alleges the popular Chinese-based apps TikTok and WeChat are stealing American users' private information and handing it to the government in Beijing. On Friday, the U.S. Commerce Department announced WeChat will be banned in the U.S. starting Sunday, while new restrictions on TikTok will also go into place. A full ban on TikTok could come into effect in November. After weeks of bidding, tech giant Oracle submitted a proposal to run the apps in the United States. But before it was approved, the U.S. government moved ahead with the ban. We have some great options and maybe we can keep a lot of people happy, but have the security that we need. We have to have the total security from China. U.S. social media apps like Facebook and Instagram are banned in China. But TikTok officials say this decision could affect the entire industry. They're vowing to fight the new restrictions in the courts. Vanessa Pappas, TikTok's general manager in the U.S., is inviting Facebook and Instagram to publicly join our challenge and support our litigation. This is a moment to put aside our competition and focus on core principles like freedom of expression and due process of law. WeChat has more than 1.2 billion active users, but less than 2% are from the United States. The biggest impact could be on U.S. companies like Walmart, Starbucks, Nike and Amazon. They all use WeChat's e-commerce platform in China to conduct business. This week's move is part of a bigger fight the Trump administration continues to wage with Beijing. In recent weeks, the U.S. has taken multiple actions, including rejecting Chinese sovereignty over disputed parts of the South China Sea, blacklisting China's largest tech company, Huawei, and canceling the visas of thousands of Chinese grad students and researchers in the United States. One analyst argues the move by the Trump administration could have unintended consequences. One of the principles during the Cold War is we try to get as much information in to communist countries as we could. We dropped leaflets, we blasted the radio, and now we're cutting off one of the main mechanisms we have for telling people about democracy and the rest of the world. This latest fight with China is a risky one for Trump. With just weeks until the U.S. election, 20% of TikTok users will vote for the first time in November. And Trump's move is likely to be unpopular. Kimberly Helk at Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, China has condemned the U.S. decision to ban TikTok and WeChat and urges Washington to stop what it calls bullying behavior and wrongdoing. It says it will take the necessary measures to safeguard the interests of Chinese businesses. Now, China's Ministry of Commerce also retaliated with regulations aimed at foreign companies that it sees as a threat to national sovereignty and security. And TikTok's payment company ByteDance has filed a complaint in a US federal court challenging Trump's executive order. Well, let's take a closer look at these two Chinese apps that have more than 100 million users in the United States. TikTok is a video sharing app. 
users can post up to a minute of video and have access to a vast database of songs and filters. It's been downloaded two billion times globally and connects a collects a huge amount of user data, including what videos people watch, their phone model and even how they type. WeChat is described as a super app used for messaging, social media and electronic payments. You can do your shopping and book a taxi or even an appointment with a doctor on the app. It has around a billion active users worldwide. Around 19 million of those are reported to be in the United States. It's popular among Chinese students and expats and people who do business with China. Well, let's bring in our guests from San Francisco. We're joined by Mitch Stoltz, Senior Staff Attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Manya Kutzi, a Sinologist and Editor-in-Chief at What's on Weibo, joins us from Amsterdam. And from Stores Connecticut is Depayan Ghosh, the Co-Director of Digital Platforms and Democracy Project at the Harvard Kennedy School. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, let's start with you, Mitch. Just explain to us why is the US proposing a ban on TikTok and WeChat? What exactly is the national security uh, rationale for this ban? Uh, thank you. It's, honestly, it's fairly vague. It has to do with China having the ability to collect personal data from users of the app, which you know are, includes uh, millions of Americans. Um, they are claiming that as a national security threat. Well, if it is a, a national security uh, threat, then, then surely the, the US is justified in such a ban. If this app can go through your contacts, find out how you type in real time, access all this information, uh, surely the government is right to, to take some action? Not really, and for a couple of reasons. For, for one, there are many apps that can collect that same sort of data. Um, now, many of them are US-based, many of them are not. That, that sort of data gets collected now, and that's not a good thing that that gets collected. Um, what we really need is comprehensive privacy laws you know, in the United States that, that would uh, uh, regulate the collection and use of that data. But the collection that WeChat does is not unique. Um, the other reason is uh, the, the First Amendment to the US Constitution puts pretty strict limits on the, the ways that the government can interfere with speech. And banning an entire uh, uh, communications platform from the United States is a really significant interference with the speech of Americans. And that requires a very high level of justification. So it takes more than a vague statement that this app uh, will harm national security uh, there really needs to be specifics, and we've never seen those specifics, and, and that's not enough to pass the constitutional test. Okay, my my Akutsi, uh, you come to us with the, the perspective from China. You, you work a lot uh, with social media in China. Uh, how is this ban being perceived in mainland China and beyond? Well, actually, uh, also just what what Mitch now says actually is uh, something that you also hear a lot uh, by Chinese experts and social media responses that people say this ban has nothing to do with the national security of the U.S. This has everything to do with protecting American digital hegemony and uh, the American authorities being afraid of the social media landscape in the world shifting towards de-Westernization and shifting towards the digital rise of China. And I mean, America used to be the main player when it, uh, you know, when it was about social media, but this is changing drastically. And they say that it is more about this than it is about security. But there's a certain double standard there, Manya, when you look about the apps that are blocked in China. Facebook has been trying to, to work in China for years. Uh, Twitter has also been banned. The, the Chinese aren't, uh, they aren't hesitant to impose bans of their own, and not just in tech, but across the board, really. So why is it OK for China to do this, but it's not OK for the US? 
Well, the difference is that America is a democracy. So, uh, and I mean, America prides itself in being a free country. So what a lot of social media users in China today are writing is, uh, well, is this free America? So this is what you pride yourself with. So, I mean, of course there is some hypocrisy there, but uh, they all know that they are living in a digital environment that has the great firewall of China around them. So, I mean, Chinese social media users are very much aware of the censorship and the, the online environment that they are living in. Okay, uh, let me turn to you, Depaya and Ghosh. The Trump administration is saying this is very much about national security, and they argue that they have the right to take action when it comes to apps that are overreaching. Do you think this is about tech overreach, or do you think that this it has more political, a, a more political subtext that they're in the middle of a, a trade war with China, and this is the US trying to stop strong arm a better conditions for American companies? Well, you know, I think I think this is entirely political. Um, the, that that's to say, the motivation behind this decision from the Trump administration uh, is entirely political. Uh, we we have this election coming up. I think um, this sort of action certainly motivates. Uh, many, many people that may be in uh, the president's support base uh, to show up and, and be active. Um, I, I think it's, it's the sort of thing that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that energizes uh, much of his following. Um, he's, he's taken a number of actions to, to instigate uh, this, this uh, trade war with, with China. And, and I think, um, I think this, this only uh, supports all of that, all of those measures. Now, that's not to say that there's not a national security risk here. Uh, I think, uh, hypothetically, there there could very well be. And as Mitch uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this, the, both of these applications collect a lot of information, um, and uh, we we know of other Chinese companies that do work very closely with the with the Chinese uh, authorities. Um, and if uh, in any way ByteDance or or uh, uh, we we chat we're, we're doing any of that then I think um, these two companies could very well be justifiably be um, uh, uh, these two companies could very well be presenting a national security risk to the United States but as Mitch mentioned we we just we don't know that much because uh, the administration has not been very forthcoming with uh, with the circumstances here. Do you think that this is a, a Biden administration would take steps to reverse this, or is there is there a certain logic in taking this kind of action when it comes to privacy and the amount of data that that apps collect? You know, I think I think the Biden administration would uh, certainly come in and and try to understand uh, where the Trump administration was coming from and. Since we don't know that right now, the public does not know exactly how the Trump administration is analyzing this, this decision right now, it's hard for me to say what the Biden administration would potentially do. But I imagine that, uh, that it would try to uh, develop a fair approach to, to this decision, um, try to understand whether or not these two applications uh, uh, actually present an, a serious national security risk to the United States. Uh, whether they actually, uh, they, they certainly collect a lot of information, but are they are they profiling uh, U.S. users uh, to the end of handing that uh, information over to the Chinese government? That is something that the Biden administration would try to substantiate, uh, I, I imagine, and um, and uh, take a decision thereafter. But it but it certainly wouldn't be for uh, for the very raw political reasons that the, that the Trump administration is, uh, is undertaking right now. Let's talk about uh, privacy and about data collection, because it's the data collection which appears to be the driving force behind this ban. And certainly there have been studies done, uh, reverse engineering of what TikTok does, which, which shows the extent of the, the data collection, which has caused reasonable concerns. M Mitch Stoltz, um, if I can ask you, are you, what should apps be doing? Should they not be collecting as much data? Because a lot of these social media apps, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, heaven knows what else, their business model really is based 
on collecting the most intimate data possible. So, so what's the solution to this? There are ways to support those business models that don't require collecting as much data as they do. And even within the constraints of, of this advertising-based business model that involves uh, targeting I individual consumers, all of these companies, uh, uh, whether TikTok or, or Facebook or Twitter, can, can do a whole lot more to collect only what they need and not retain that data longer than is needed. Um, those are the sort of basic uh, legal principles that, again, have not been imposed uh, in the United States outside of very specific contexts, but probably should. More broadly, you know, there's, there are a lot of questions about whether the behavioral targeting advertising-based business model of some of these major websites uh, is the only way to do it. And it may be that advertising may be just as valuable and just as strong of a way to support the businesses of, of these websites and apps um, without collecting that uh, level of data and storing it forever. Because it does seem to be quite critical, Mitch, the, because the big tech companies were hauled up in front of Congress uh, not that long ago, and Google and Apple seem to be collecting terrific amounts of data on all their users. So this doesn't appear to be on the, the surface of it just about the Chinese companies. How much of a willingness is there within uh, the American Congress, certainly, to actually tackle this issue? Not a whole lot right now, um, particularly as regards American companies, uh, but that could change. Um, there is a lot of broad movement towards uh, guaranteeing more protections for internet users, privacy protections in particular. Of course, Europe has a, a, a strong uh, set of privacy protections for internet users. Um, it does, in, but in it doesn't America, have a thriving and vibrant tech sector. That's correct. Do the two are, are, are the two in any way interlinked? It is a tough problem. Um, crafting privacy rules that uh, don't uh, hamper small companies or favor the largest ones is a difficult problem, but it's one that we really have to tackle. Um, and simply banning apps is not a very good way to do that. You, you could um, draw a, a pretty close parallel between uh, uh, TikTok and, the, and American apps like Facebook. Um, the, this move by the Trump administration sort of bridges that last gap where they sort of become arms of the government because they are told what to do and not to do. Um, and I'm thinking here really of the app stores, or Apple and, uh, and Google that, that, that run app stores. They are the targets of this executive order. They're being told, you, a private business, cannot carry this app. You cannot um, provide this particular set of, okay. of ones and zeros to your users. Okay. That's a whole lot like what we suspect China does with its companies. So this makes us not all that much different from China. Uh, quite. Uh, let's have, take a look at the impact of this move and, and, and what it's likely to achieve. Uh, Manya Kotsi, uh, many of our viewers might not be familiar with WeChat, but it is quite a fundamental app for, for many Chinese people and for the Chinese diaspora. Give us a sense of just how important this app is to China, Chinese communities, and what sort of impact you think banning this app will have? Oh, that impact will be huge for Chinese families who are separated, people studying in the United States. Often it's their only way of staying in touch with their families. WeChat, you can imagine, is like the key to your everyday urban life in China today. It is how you pay, it is how you uh, do uh, business contacts, how you talk to your friends, how you order a cab, how you do your groceries. Uh, without WeChat, you're pretty much nowhere. So although uh, the app is not that popular in America, the impact will still be big for those in America who depend on WeChat to talk with their parents or to receive money, for example. And how, how do you think this, th this will play out? Because it sounds like there's an intentional wedge being driven between uh, China and the US. Certainly the TikTok ban still has a, a few more days to see if this app will be sold. With WeChat, this is coming in instantly. And so how do you think 
Chinese communities will, will, will see this? Will they see it like the US government's out to get them? Or, or how do you think this will be interpreted? Oh, yes. You know, a lot of people say this is a, a type of bullying. and But also they say that America is sh shooting itself in their own foot because it will also impact American businesses. Uh, but what I saw today on Chinese social media is that people were talking about Tencent launching the WeCom app. And from what I understood, the WeCom app is like the WeChat app, but is registered under a different name. So the question is, how far will Tencent go to circumvent the ban? And how far will Trump go to make sure that WeChat will really be banned, even if it uses a different name in the U.S.? OK, let, let's take a look at the, the, the future now, what the future holds. Obviously, there are political dimensions to this, uh, which will, will change over several, uh, several years. But in terms of the way that tech is moving forward, um, Dipayan Ghosh, do you think we're getting into a, a state where we have a Chinese internet and we have an American internet and a European internet? What, what does the future hold? Are these bans the way forward? Well, I, I don't know if they're the way forward in the, in the steady state, in the very long run. Uh, but certainly we're, we're seeing the splinter net uh, happen before our eyes, where uh, uh, perhaps we, we, we thought that the U.S. Uh, might have this, this open, democratic, op uh, free market approach to Internet regulation which, and Internet governance, which it, which it has had since uh, the 90s. Uh, but now with this, uh, with this, sh with this uh, shutout of, of uh, the most popular Chinese applications, and, and by the way, other Chinese applications and, and, um, and, and technology, previously, uh, we are seeing this divergence, um, and, and Europe is off in, in its own corner as well in, in many ways, where it doesn't, it, it has a different flavor. It doesn't have these leading uh, names over the internet, these leading companies. Uh, but has this very rigorous approach to putting the consumer and the citizens' rights first, uh, and uh, and thinking about commerce uh, as a secondary uh, interest um, to uh, to the individual's rights. And of course, we have China. So, so I think uh, I think there's no doubt we're we're seeing uh, these different approaches to internet governance split off from one another. Um, and many people have been saying that this was this was only inevitable. But uh, you know, I think that circumstances could change very quickly if if uh, if Biden wins the presidency in the United States, um, uh, or uh, under under many other different contingencies. Okay, um, are you worried? And very quickly, if you wouldn't mind, Depay and Ghosh, are you worried about the potential repercussions on companies like Apple and Google uh, when China decides to retaliate? Uh, I'm not worried uh, right now. I, I think um, I think circumstances will change after November, but um, uh, and and the Trump administration, even if it stays in power, has has left open uh, a door uh, for for a deal to still happen. Um, uh, meanwhile, Apple and Google are are cash rich. These are these are some of the richest country, uh, uh, companies in, in the history of the United States. I'm more worried about uh, about internet governance and. Uh, anyone from one point in the world to be able to speak with someone else and do commerce with someone else okay. and, and have access to information. Okay, um, we're down to the last 30 seconds or so. So a quick answer uh, from each of you, if you wouldn't mind. Mitch Stoltz, uh, do you think the future lies in internet governance or do you think we should let this play out in an organic way? I think the United States needs to be uh, stand uh, stand up for its principles of free speech and and not sort of retaliate and and in in uh, resisting China become China. Uh, okay. Internet governance will have a role to play. And well. uh, Manya Kutsi, do you think internet governance is uh, will play a stronger role, or do you think that the Chinese will continue as they've been going on, and the Americans will have to find their own feet? Yes, exactly. I mean, in China, uh, the internet is extremely controlled. There's no other country in the world that has internet that is so controlled. So uh, it will keep on going the same way for the years to come, for sure. OK. And finally, Depay and Ghosh, uh, quick answer from you. What do you think the future holds in terms of governance, given the Chinese are unlikely to adapt and change their own strategy? I think for a time we're going to continue seeing this, this splinter net unfold. But... Uh, it, over time, we will we will all converge again.
OK, we will all keep our fingers crossed for a much more open internet. But for now, uh, to all three of my guests, thank you very much indeed. Mitch Stoltz, Manja Kurtze and Dupayant Ghosh. And thank you too for watching from home. You can see this programme again anytime, of course, by heading to our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to the social media app of your choice. We have a Facebook page, forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle's at AJ Inside Story. Or tweet me directly at Hal Mohideen. But for now, for me and the whole team, it's bye for now.